Hello and welcome once again to uh, the fourth part of the um, Block C in-depth uh, explanation videos. So this time I'll be going over the instance point system. So the basic premise of the system is that it takes input from the grid system and immediately turns it into um, instance points. So the reason a part disappeared here is because that's um, what we're going to look at first. So um, this is the separate pieces section. So what this does is it takes L-shaped rooms or rooms that um, have concavity, um, as mentioned earlier. So that is plus shaped room, L-shaped room, and T-shaped rooms. Um, so currently I'm only letting it loop till five. So this is a for each subnetwork and it loops over all the um, segments. So if I turn this off, you can see everything is there. But um, for the sake of explaining this, let's go here. So basically, this is the input geometry. So it takes the grid geometry. And um, the first thing it does is it goes over every primitive and finds the adjacent. Now, the way it does that is um, it uses this VEX script here. Um, and personally, every time I look at it, I find it a bit intimidating. But um, it's actually pretty simple. Um, so what it does is it takes a primitive. So let's say it takes primitive number two. It finds another primitive. So it loops for the amount of primitives there are. Um, so it finds the another primitive. So let's say it finds zero. It then takes the points that are on primitive zero and checks those against the points that are on primitive two. So in this case, point six and three are on the same. So pr uh, primitive zero has point three and six and point and primitive two has point three and six. Um, and that's exactly what it does. So if more than two points are found, that means that they're adjacent. Uh, so if it's just one, it can mean that it's diagonally adjacent, but here I'm looking for full on adjacent. So here I add that to an attribute. So um, you can see here in the bottom left that primitive number zero has primitive two as adjacent, primitive one has two as adjacent, and primitive two has zero and one as adjacent. Now there's a buddy attribute here set to 999 um, that's used in the node after this. So let's go there now. Um, so here's the find buddy part. And what this basically does, and you might have noticed that there are a couple of attributes got added and edited. What this does is it goes over a primitive, checks to see if the primitive has more than one adjacent. So primitive zero has one adjacent, primitive one has one adjacent, so that's primitive two. But primitive two is connected to both one and zero. Now the first thing it does is it sets the buddy attribute to two. So um, yeah, right now the um, current primitive, which is this primitive here, has a body attribute of two. Um, and it sets the center primitive attribute, so center prim here, it sets it to one. So then the system knows, okay, this is a center primitive and it holds all sorts of information, which is what I loop over here. So here it um, takes that center primitive and it adds the edges. So it again ex, uh, executes that same script from before, only this time it stores the points. So here you can see a string that says 3620 and th 7321. So what that basically means is, let's look at the first one. And as you can see here, we have adjacent, so 0, 0. Um, and this is the first one. So uh, between primitive two and primitive zero. So you can see in the bottom left here um, that the edges attribute two and zero. So the second part is basically the primitive. So between primitive two and zero, three and six, point three and six are the adjacent edge. And the same goes for this one. So we have two and one, and there are seven and three make the adjacent edge. Um, so I thought I would need this attribute later to make certain groups, um, which is what I do here. So here I add those um, edge arrays to detail. So you can see here we have our edges. 
Um, and based on that, I think I add some groups. Yeah. So all these points, there's points here. So at the end here, we have a point group that says overlapping. So basically, if a point is within the, um, oh, whoops, um, if a point is overlapping, it gets added to the overlapping group. So six, three, and seven are added to this group. Um, after that, I add a center attribute, which I think goes all the way in the primitive. Oh no, actually it goes to point, there we go. So um, what it does there is it makes, first it makes center points out of everything. Um, so yeah, this is a very basic script. So it uses uh, an add point function and then removes the primitive. So this script loops over primitives. And basically I found that if you um, execute the add points and then use the add p, which usually refers to the um, position. So here we are set the geometry spreadsheet to points. And you can see there's three points in all of the position. But um, if you go to primitives, so there's none now, but uh, the primitives don't have an attribute called position. Um, only the points have those. So apparently when you call the position attribute, in most cases it won't work. But when you call it in combination with a add points, it apparently takes all the points that are on the primitive. So there'll be this point, this point, this point, this point, and averages them, which means they get turned into the centroid. Um, this centroid then gets a attribute called one. Now I'm noticing now that this is a string attribute. I'm not exactly sure why I did that. I probably had my motivations back then, but um, right now I'm just kind of wondering why it happened. So um, meanwhile, I'll also do some other things to this geometry here. So I first convert it to line. What that basically means is um, all the geometry gets turned into line segments instead of a full primitive. And here I make target lines. So what this means is, um, ah, right, yes. So uh, if I think somewhere in here, yes, here we go. So um, this is the intersect function in the VEX version of it. So I used this earlier in another video in the, um, if I recall correctly, adding the doors, no, uh, add grid system. So um, this function just takes a position, takes a direction and it shoots a ray. Uh, which is exactly what I do. So I take the position of the current primitive, or the centroid in this case, and then I shoot a ray towards the adjacent primitives. So if you look at point zero here, let's actually go here and then turn this into ghost. Well, actually, uh, there we go. So you can see that point two shot a ray towards point zero but it hit this primitive here. So it made a point there. And now I've got, and it does that for everything. Um, in case of point zero and one, it knows that it's not a centroid room because of that center attribute. So it also shoots it backwards until it hits this one. So we get this line here and this line here. So the center lines are used later on in the instance point system to create uh, target points. So. Here I set the piece type to target line and I transfer some attributes, I think, yeah. So um, if you now go back to the primitives, you can see here that there's a bunch of target lines. Now, if I go to this merge, you can see that there's a bunch of new attributes as well as this target line attribute. So we know that these are target lines and that these are just regular primitives. Um, there's a switch here just to make sure that if the um, Let's see if the um, if the room type isn't L-shaped or plus-shaped or T-shaped, then this whole thing doesn't get triggered, so it doesn't happen. Moving on to the door and midpoint, so um, this is another place where I just add some info, and the doors are the most important thing. So um, the first major thing here is that it. Um, there's two sides to this. So here we have a switch. Uh, and basically what it first does is it checks to see, is it a corridor or stair, or is it an actual room? Because corridors uh, don't hold 
the information for doors. Um, I only need those in the um, rooms. So that's the first thing that happens in the switch. Uh, here it checks for the type. So it basically says if it's a walkway or a stair, then set the switch to zero, otherwise set it to one, which is exactly what happens here. So um, I just transfer some attributes and that's all that happens. Now, going on to here, which is the more interesting part, um, here I loop over the groups and cut out the doors. So if I select this, you can see it now has a bunch of new points as well as um, all these other points that are in line. Um, and what isn't visible and only visible in the geometry spreadsheet is that there is now a bunch more groups. So we have a overlapping group, outer edges group, info point group, fuse group, far side group and door group. Um, and it all happens inside of here. So this make, is made out of two parts, so an info point and a far side point. Now, this section here is meant mostly for, um, for some of this is actually mostly meant for L-shaped rooms or T or whatever, um, but every part except for walkways and corridors goes through here. Um, the main thing they go through is this. So here I basically take the door points from the output. So remember earlier in the system, we made these door points. Um, I import those in here only if they are connected to this uh, primitive or um, floor piece. And I copy some lines on them. Now this little uh, vex node here or wrangle node, what it basically does is it checks to see if the point number is divisible by two. Um, so it uses a integer division. Um, so it's either going to return zero or one and it flips the points around. The reason I do this is to make sure that um, the points are altering. So if I turn this off, actually let's turn off the primitive numbers. So if I flip it on and off, you can see that some of the point numbers alter. Um, and what that means is that if I have an add node, right now you can see they're all neat and blocked up so they don't touch the geometry in here, which is very important. But if I turn this node off, they kind of cut through. And the chance that, for instance, in here, they hit the geometry as well. So I'd get three points instead of two, which is what I want to avoid. So the curve sec node, um, it's a pretty simple node. It takes input geometry and um, looks for intersection with curves. Uh, in this case, we have the middle center primitive here. So um, what I do here is I just delete some attributes fuse occasional points and we can join it. This part is mostly for the, um, to make sure that all the primitives are fit together. So if I can actually do this, uh, let's see, does it work? Yes, it does. So here we can see that if I do this, it creates unique points. So you can see it's not very visible here, but sometimes it creates uh, unique points. So to make sure everything is in the right point order, and that everything is connected as a primitive, I just make it a whole again using the join node. Then I use some selection groups. So this is just a bunch of groups. So here again, use those door points to place some spheres for a group. Here I use um, the overlapping points from before. So here you have that overlapping group to um, add another overlapping group, basically transferring it. And here I use a metaball surface. So we have this here. So we know this is the far side, um, which I determine here. Um, this is the far side because it isn't directly connected to the center. So I determine this is the far side. Um, I make a meta surface out of that and group that as well. So as you can see here, there are some doors on this side. Um, so I couldn't just copy points on the outer parts, I need to make it a, a whole thing. So these are labeled as far side. Um, here there's a switch because um, if this room isn't a, a weirdly shaped room such as T plus or whatever, it means that this isn't necessary. Um, from there, I just transfer some attributes over. So piece type and class, um, which brings us to the left side or the info point side. So what this basically does is it takes a point from every center primitive. 
Um, this center point has all the information on it. So if I take this down here, you can see it has all the information on it. Um, and yeah, this basically just makes sure it's in a compactor format. Um, I found processing points a lot easier because uh, you have a lot more access to various types of information. Looping over primitives works just as well, but I personally find points are just one level lower than primitives. So it's easier to combine them with things. And this geometry is then output. So let's not forget to do this. There we go. Uh, these are then views, as you can see here. There are some overlapping points, which we don't want. So I just fuse everything, merge it together with the target lines, and there we go. Um, attribute gets transferred, this time not with a point wrangle or a primitive wrangle, but with an attribute transfer, wanted to try something new. So here we go. Um, now after this comes the instance system. So let's first turn this off, there we go. So this is the part where the instance points get made. Um, if I dive in here, you can see that it's made out of uh, four subnets uh, and some stuff around it. So first to get to the stuff around it, um, the first thing that happens is the type gets determined. So here I check for if it's a walkway or stairs, a target line or a floor slash platform. Uh, depending on the type, it goes through one of these. So walkways or stairs go to the corridors, normal rooms go to the circular and um, let's see, what did I call them? Uh, right, if there is a target line in there, it goes to the target room, um, which I dubbed multi-square room because of their multi-square nature. Um, so let's first go over the corridor because right now it seems that we have a corridor piece input. So um, the type info picked corridor and there it goes. So um, in here we have a pretty big system. Um, so to start off, it just takes the points. Um, earlier on, by the way, these were cleared. So um, the doors were kind of removed just to not have to worry about them. Um, and here I use another thing I found out about very recently. Um, apparently the resample node can be controlled by an attribute. So what I do here is I take the length of the primitive. So here we have two primitives. I make the length out of both using a measure node. And then I use this segment count wrangle here to set the amount of segments. Now, why would you do that? Because of course the resample node does actually have an option for this. So you can just use this option. Um, well, I did this because um, this offers per primitive control over the amount of points. And then you could say, well, since you're just using the length and dividing it by um, the maximum segment length, that would be the same as using a maximum segment length. Um, well, the reason I made these choices is because using this, you have per primitive control and the maximum segment length sometimes messes up and tries to stretch. So let's say if uh, my line is a length of 1.2 and my minimum, my maximum segment length is set to one, it'll make the length between these things a bit longer. So in here, um, I can kind of make an additional little script that could say, oh, well, um, make sure that if the length is a bit bigger then add another point. Now I didn't do it in this case uh, because I wanted just the per primitive control, but those are possibilities. Um, another thing I do here is I make some cross vectors. Um, so for this, I'll have to turn on some attributes, the direction vector, if I recall correctly, there we go, as well as normals. So I think for now they're just normals. No, they're actually their direction vector. So you can see this yellow line here, um, and that's basically two vectors pointing towards each other. So that's what happens here. Um, some simple vector math, take the position of the other point and subtract a current position from it to make a direction towards the other point. Uh, this is then transferred to the rest of the points. So here you can see no attribute, and here there is actually an attribute. Um, also something of note is that these points currently oh they apparently don't have normals okay um, then these normals I guess just kind of appear out of nowhere oh no actually so this also has an up vector somewhere 
all right, I add that in here. So in the um, segment count, I add a up vector, which is a one of these standard attributes accepted by Houdini to use in a copy node or whatever. So here I place it and I um, use a cross function to take the direction and the up vector to make a normal. So basically what the cross function does is it takes two vectors, as I input here, and it makes a third. So using those two, it determines a third. So if I turn on the up vector, you can see it points, this one points up, this one points sideways, and here it makes a third one, which points in another direction. So here we get direction in our points uh, using those normals as well as up vectors. So let's actually, you know, let's keep those on make things look a bit uh, more colorful. So from here, it kind of splits into multiple parts. Um, so I guess we'll go from left to right. So first thing I do is make the inner arches. Now this place uses a lot of VEX, but they're all very small scripts to just process data quickly. Um, so what I do here is I find the opposite point. So right now, these are similarly sized um, lines, and they all have opposite points. So in this case, I use the length vector or the direction vector. Um, so if you go to the left here a little bit, let's see, yes. So, um, ah, right, whoops, I'm supposed to look a bit further. So first of all, I make sure that I only keep the outer points because this is for the inner arches. Um, I find the opposite. So here we can see it's just looking at the other side using this script again. So what this script basically does is it um, takes the direction vector, takes the length of set direction vector, and uses a near points function to search in a radius on the other side. So here you can see point zero has opposite of two, two has zero, and vice versa for one and three. Um, so here I basically take those apart and turn them into placement points. So these are the inner door arches, um, and these points here on the side are the uh, points to place door segments on, um, which brings us to the pillar points. So first of all, I delete the doors. Sorry. Um, and again, do that find opposite thing. And then I kind of reset the normals to follow the curve instead of kind of pointing out. Um, and here I just add a attribute. So I do this in a lot of places. I think I do it here as well. Yeah. So this attribute type basically follows a certain naming convention of what type of point it is. So in this case, a placement point, arch or pillar, um, row. So I have divided this in first, second, and um, top what the type is, so in this corridor, and what location it is relative, relatively. So this can be inner, outer, or wall. Uh, so in here, we have our pillars. So that's placement, pillar, it's the first layer. It's a corridor, and these are meant to be large pillars. Um, so here I just do some more grouping, making sure the um, up vector is kind of changed. So now it points along here. And then I just make sure they're just points because I don't want the connection between them because I don't need it. It's unnecessary information at this point. Um, so now to the arches. So there's two sections to this, one that is the in-between arches and one that is the um, wall arches, as I call them. So just going through the same process. Um, this is the line to placement point asset I made. Um, what this basically does is it uses a convert line to convert every line segment to a primitive. In this case, it isn't necessary because they're all already primitives. Um, it promotes the normal attribute, which is later transferred back, um, and just uses that add point and remove primitive uh, script I used before as well. I just transfer some normals um, as well as p skills. So p skill is another one of those Houdini attributes that is used by nodes as um, the copy sop, sweep sop. Um, in this case, we also have the copy to 
points, I think, and copy to copy stamp. Um, it's used by those nodes to determine the size of an object. Uh, so there are some unnecessary attributes are created, such as length. Right now, the length is turned into P skill. So here, I just delete the length because I don't need it. Um, and it's then exported. And again, here I set the type and I set the direction vector to 111 because the normals are already determining the direction for the uh, placement. So just to remind myself, I set the direction to 111 to make sure that I remember that. Um, here we have the outer arches or wall arches, and it's the same process. On the only thing different is this little thing here. So instead of um, here, it says inner, here it says walls. And I was having the occasional issue with that. Sometimes the up vector would flip downwards because of the cross function. So the only thing um, that is a bad thing about the cross function is that you don't know what direction your third vector is going to point. So in this case, we had our um, vector that pointed um, along the line and the vector that pointed inwards. And we wouldn't be able to say if the up vector would point up or down. So with this, I check, OK, is the y value from the up vector pointing downwards? Yes, then flip it. Um, and here some more grouping happens to ensure that I just have a lot of groups to work from. Um, and here you can see the final result. So yeah. Um, going on to the second parts, which is just normal rooms. For this, I'll have to kind of adjust this thing here. So let's see. Yes, we have a round room now. Um, I'll skip the square room for now because it isn't fully finished. Um, and it just does the same as everything else. Uh, the circular room, however, is interesting because it uses a slightly more complex setup. Um, so the base setup is kind of the same. So here we have our placement points. Here we have more placement points. And it uses the same process as the corridors. However, this inner part um, is a bit more interesting. So first, let's turn off all our attributes, except for um, the direction vectors. So this center part um, was fun to make. Uh, so what it basically does is it makes a bunch of side points. So let's again turn on this primitive numbers, actually, or points. Yes. So here we have our circle, and it makes points in between, as you can see, on the centroids. Um, and it gives them direction inwards based on the center point we made earlier. So that info point, these rooms also have that. And it is used for um, targeting as well. So here we can see the direction points inwards. Now that is transferred to this. So what I found is it's actually very logical. Um, the point number matches the primitive number it was made from. So here we have the sequence of 0, 1, 2, 3. Now if you go to the primitives, you can see it says 0, 1, 2, 3. So it follows the same sequence. Because of this, I could make this script here. Um, so this is one of the formations I wanted to make of arches pointing inward and then arches from there pointing even more inward. Um, you'll be able to see more of this later uh, in the arch placement system. Um, so what I did here is I looped over primitives and I picked the position or the direction from those points you saw earlier. So because the primitive numbers match up with these points, I was able to say, OK, take the primitive number and find the um, direction vector on that primitive number and then place a point along that. So here I can determine how far away the point is. And again, this is just some simple vector math of, OK, if you have a position and add the um, Let's see, if you add the vector to that, you can multiply that vector to make it go further, so which is what I'm doing here. The more I multiply it, the more it gets displaced. And using that vector and position, I yeah place these points. So it becomes a bit more interesting over here, because here you can see they're all getting uh, direction. So this already gives you more of an idea of how those arches are going to be placed. Um, this, however, is the most interesting part of this. So here I just add some p skill based on length. 
and some more grouping and back out of the system. Um, so yes, not very interesting mostly, but um, this part was interesting to me. So moving on to the um, kind of multi-square rooms once again. So let's dive into that system. Also, it's very fun to look at how it would look if you would use um, other parts of the system. So if you just turn all these off, you can see they get turned into absolute chaos, especially the circular one um, that messes other things up really badly. But let's move to the target room. So target room or multi-square room. So this is just a big mess of points and the system inside is even bigger. So um, in general, this can be divided in preparing and removing unnecessary parts. Um, I think this is about placing points. No, this is about correction of direction. And here we just add those attributes we had before. So the you can see it here, um, the type and other things. I think some direction normals. So I won't be going over. I won't be going over this. Uh, I won't be going over this bottom section here, but I'll mostly be covering the top part. So let's actually start from the top fully. Um, so the first thing we do is remove the target line. So we don't need it for now. Um, I have another target line pass through. So here we just have the target line. Um, but here it's not necessary. So what's going to happen now is I remove the doors and inner edges and everything. So uh, this happens pretty fast. So first I again use that convert line node. Um, and everything gets converted. So as you can see, those doors have their separate primitives as well. Um, and now we get to the reason why I personally like to use um, point groups. It's because they always persist. Even if you remove the primitives, point groups kind of persist, which is why I personally like to run things over points. So here you can see I take those door groups, overlapping group and far side group made in the um, grid system to um, basically group anything that isn't necessary or that I don't want to directly use and yeah, just remove it. Um, so here is just remove all those parts because we don't want um, things to be placed on there. So here I count the amount of segments again and I add some segment numbers. So again, it gets resampled in the way I want. So this is according to um, modules I was using. So every five meters, a certain thing happens and the such. So here I add a base direction. Um, it's not really visible from here, it seems. Oh, wait, I think that's a viewport glitch. Yeah, there we go. So it's not very visible, but you can see that there's vectors pointing along the, um, the axes of these lines. Um, and in here, this gets slightly changed up. So I use a direction vector. Um, all right, I make a temporary direction. So I think I have a, yes, there we go. So here we have our temporary direction vector. So using the up vector, the um, normal, and again, the cross function, I make a temporary direction vector. But as you can see, it's kind of going everywhere, but where we want to. Um, if you view this from the top, you can see sometimes it phases inwards, sometimes it phases outwards, um, and that's not what we want. So in here, I make another temporary setup, which is a um, setup of an actual direction. So um, I use those placement points we made earlier and use those to just target them. So I use a closest, I use a near points function and um, it's set to the radius that is between the point and the point on the other side. Um, so half of that would be the target line. Um, but as you can see, some places they're kind of bent, uh, which is what the next part is all about. So here I just correct all of that. So in this part, I think I add some information. Yeah, so if we just open up our geometry spreadsheet, let's see, 
got primitives. So here I add a bunch of attributes again. Um, so these are just attributes to determine which is the center primitive, um, what points that belong to what. But because we're now on line segments instead of full primitives, I needed to re-determine that. Um, and here, magically, as you could see, the direction was corrected. Um, so the way I did that is, again, using a little VEX script. So first of all, I checked to see if the direction, if the um, primitives it is running over isn't a center primitive. So the reason this is important is because the center primitives pretty much always already work correctly um, because they are very contained. So this shape can't really deviate. Um, here there's doors cut in, so it kind of deviates. But in the center primitives, it won't do that as much. So what I do is I um, check to see if the um, direction is equal to the negative, is equal to the um, temporary direction, if that makes sense. So if it is, then it's fine. Um, but if it isn't, so I only check to see if it's equal to the negative or positive. That's because it's pointing outwards, but it should be pointing inwards in this case. So I check to see if it's equal, and if it isn't, I take the difference between the two. So let's actually pull this up here. Um, you can see there's a slight difference. So I take that difference and I um, subtract it from the vector, which basically corrects it. Um, I then take the um, length of the directional vector, so that's the long orange one, and I multiply it with the temporary vector, so which basically just, it corrects it. So it flips it and it corrects it. So now it's straightened out. Uh, then the second thing began. So what I wanted is I wanted to make these grid lines. Um, but initially I had the issues that some parts wouldn't be made or they would be made and it was all very confusing. So I just stuck it in a loop, check to see what point it is. So again, I use that opposite script. Um, but first, what the first thing it does is it checks to see if it's a center primitive. So in this case it is, I guess we got unlucky here. Let's just um, check the maximum iterations and set it to zero. Yes, that does the job. So here we have a side primitive, and what it does is it basically, first of all, it normalizes some of the vectors, um, and it just finds the opposite point, just as that script before in the um, corridor system. So again here, um, where my mouse is at in the bottom left, we have our opposite system, or opposite primitive, or points even. Uh, using those points, I make lines between them, and now comes another thing that is pretty interesting, but not visible in here. Um, let's see, where can I find this primitive? Let's see. Uh, yeah, there we go. So here you can kind of see that it's um, these lines are kind of crooked. They're not straightened out, which is what I correct in the obviously named correct position. So what I do is I again, use that direction vector to see if the um, other point is along it and check the difference between these points. So that's the first thing I do. See the difference and see what difference is the biggest. So let's say the difference in the X axis is the biggest. Then it checks to see what the difference is in the Z axis. If there is a difference, and in these cases there were, so you can see that these are kind of different. These are okay, but these have kind of slightly different positions. Um, it uses that delta, divides it by two, and adds it onto there. So what that basically does is it just averages them. It makes sure that the positions are average. So going out of the loop, it does that for each part separately. So there we go. And from there, it's just adding a bunch of attributes. Um, so we can just have another look at it. Oh, actually, this is interesting. Um, so in here, we have our corner point. So what I found is that um, these um, kind of side primitives, 
So this room here, this center room, it doesn't have a point here. But if you look at um, looking at reference from Gothic architecture, I found that this corner would have a lot of arches pointing towards the other sides. So what I did is I removed the corner pieces here. So as you can see, let's actually pull up the normal grid in our view. So here we go. Oh, whoops. Here we go. So we only have this one. Um, and we don't need this point here. So what I do is I basically, very quickly you can see it moved to zero. Um, and what I did is I took the position from these target lines, checked to see if they were um, center. Again, that's very important. Uh, what I did then is again some position manipulation. Um, so what I did is I check to see what difference was the biggest. So this runs over points. And you can see here that point zero is the center point. So what it does with point zero is it looks at the neighbors and checks to see what the difference is. So if the difference is in a very specific place, then it says, okay, you're point A, you're point B. Using point A and B, it makes a point C. So I think it would take the Z coordinates from point A, which is this point, and it would take the X coordinates from point B, which is this point, and it uses those to make point C. Um, sorry. This, um, these points here, so this geometry, which is basically the target geometry, are then given the position of that and given position vectors or direction vectors. So that's just some arches there. Um, so that will be the target rooms, and I think that's it. Oh, actually, no. Got one more part here. This is determining whether it's a square room or a circle room. So let's go back to, I think it would be seven. Yes, it is. So this part here, um, it checks to see what type it is. So that happens in here, I think. Yeah. So it's really simple. It checks to see how many points there are. And the only reason that works is because I'm using auxiliary input two. So uh, remember before where we in the add grid uh, part, um, that video was an earlier video I made about an earlier section. So I made two grids. Uh, one has subdivisions and one is just completely clear. So if a grid is completely clear, a this a, it doesn't have room doors cut out. No, it doesn't. So it doesn't have doors. So if a room is square, it only has four points. And of course, a circle has more than four points. So in here, I basically check, OK, if the number of points is four, then you're a square room. If it doesn't, then you're a circular room. So that's that setup. Um, and at the end, again, a class transfer to make sure that it's consistent throughout the whole system, which brings us to the end. Um, so that will be that for the instance point system. Um, after this, we have two more videos, one for the place arches and one for the proof of concept. So um, thank you very much for watching and hopefully till the next one.